Fantasy Flight Games. While a company that is mostly known for their board games, they have dabbled in role-playing games several times over the years. Most of these were just another case of jumping on the OGL bandwagon, but there were a few hidden gems in the mix. Some of these include the childhood terrors of Grimm, the underrated dual-era fantasy in Fireborn, and translating the Gestalt epic Anima from Spain. However, they were a board and miniatures company first and foremost, and their RPG lines received considerably less support. This all changed around 2008 with their partnership with Games Workshop, publishing a wide variety of board and card games with the Warhammer Fantasy and Warhammer 40,000 license. Of course, this also included role-playing games like the very successful 40,000 Quintet and the very controversial Fantasy Roleplay 3rd Edition. Both would end shortly after FFG's partnership with Asmodee Games, both properties going to separate developers. I bring up both of these games because FFG's take on Star Wars, hereafter referred to as the Genesis system, after their recently announced universal version of this mechanic, is in one way or another a linear successor to both these games. The obvious part is in having Jay Little, the lead designer for Warhammer 3rd Edition, being the lead designer for Genesis. On the other hand, the three games that occupy FFG's Star Wars line are intended to be sister games in a shared universe emphasizing certain settings. Edge of the Empire for your Outer Rim Outlaws, Age of Rebellion for combating in the Galactic Civil War, and Force and Destiny for playing the Jedi. This is similar to the 40k quintet in that each game series in that line had a separate yet connected setting. Now does it hold up, or have the sins of the father become visited upon the sons? Let's find out. Fantasy Flight Games has a reputation from some of the best production values in the industry, and these books are no exception. In the previous games, there's been a mix of original art and film stills. Not as much here. I'd say the vast majority of the art presented in these books are either original drawings or art mock-ups with the appearance of characters and scenes from the films. In addition to the use of symbol language from the films, it adds to the book's identity, especially since each of the individual lines has its own quirks. It's also worth noting that instead of trying to encompass multiple eras of play like the previous games did, this focuses on Episode 4 specifically. The elephant in the room regarding this is, of course, Force and Destiny. It's in an awkward position where its appearance in art is akin to the Old Republic, but its setting information is still heavily rooted in the Empire area. It creates a weird mix. Other than that, though, I'd say this entry is probably the strongest visual identity of the games covered so far. Character creation in this instance is simple, but with its own quirks regarding crunch. Now, as before, we'll be using the young Jedi archetype we've been using throughout this series. Because of that, we'll be focusing on Force and Destiny in regard to character creation, but diving into the other books for a certain spot we'll get to in a moment. It should be noted, though, that character creation is virtually identical across all three series, with one exception. Step one is selecting a species. Now, species selection here is a much more significant matter than in previous games, as it provides half of your foundation. Namely, your starting attributes, thresholds, experience to spend, and a unique benefit tied to each species. As with before, we're going with Human. This provides us a starting rank of two in the six abilities. Brawn, Agility, Intellect, Cunning, Willpower, and Presence. Because of this, our base Wound and Strain thresholds start out at 12. We also gain 110 experience points and a free rank in two non-career skills. The second step is your character's drive. Your reasoning for adventuring, for lack of a better word. These can take three forms depending on the books, and is the only real deviation that the series has. There's a different subset of rules for each of these. Edge of the Empire has Obligation, which acts as their debt to something. This can range from a debt to a crime lord, to family that needs to be taken care of. Obligation can range from 5 to 20 at the start, and can be increased to grant specific benefits. However, at the start of each session, a percentile roll for an obligation check is rolled. Failure reduces your strain threshold, as well as throws a monkey wrench into the adventure. Age of Rebellion, on the other hand, uses duty, one status in their given organization, and obviously the Rebellion is the default. It typically acts as the inverse version of obligation, as rolling low with duty can result in positive effects. In addition, every time the party collectively earns 100 duty, they may gain a contribution rank and be rewarded with equipment, vehicles, or other advantages. Finally, and most relevant to our case, Force and Destiny uses a morality system, which represents their alignment with the light and dark sides of the Force. Morality always starts at 50. Instead of spending morality for a starting benefit at start, you can pick one from a selection. 
During play, if a character does an immoral act, uses dark side points to fuel force powers, or fails certain fear checks, he gains a point of conflict. At the end of the session, that player rolls a d10 and compares the result to his accumulated conflict. If it's lesser, the character loses morality equal to the difference. If it's greater, he gains morality equal to the difference instead. In addition, having extremely high or low morality confers additional effects. Since we're playing a Jedi, obviously we'll be using morality. Weighing the options of the list of benefits, we increase our total XP to 10, giving us 120 XP. The third step is choosing a career and a specialization. Both are instrumental in determining what you're good at concerning the skills you can easily acquire, as well as granting a rank in three of its associated career skills and two in your specialization skills for free. Additionally, specializations determine the advantages you can purchase with experience points, as well as being the determining factor for your combat style. Since we're using one of the Jedi careers, we start with a force rating of 1. For the purposes of this character, we're going with Warrior as our career and Shi Cho Knight as our specialization. Thus we have one rank in five of the following career skills. Athletics, Brawl, Cool, Coordination, Lightsaber, Melee, Perception, and Survival. In addition, we can choose two skills from outside that career list. Our specialization also determines our starting talent tree, which we can spend experience on active, passive, and force talents for. This is in addition to the universal talent trees like force powers, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now given all that, our skill choices are going to be athletics, coordination, discipline, lightsaber, melee, perception, and survival. The third step is spending the starting experience. Here we have 120 XP to spend, and this can be spent on improving characteristics, skills, talents, force powers, or new specializations. For the purposes of this, we opted to go for the following advances. One rank in Lightsaber and Perception, one rank in Brawn and Agility, and the following talents. Multiple Opponents, Parry, Rank 2, Toughened, Second Wind, Rank 2, and the Enhanced Force Power. The fifth step is determining our derived attributes namely our wound and strain thresholds, defense, and soak value. Barring defense, each is determined by a specific attribute, brawn for wound threshold and soak value, and willpower for strain. Finally, we have 500 credits to spend on personal gear, after which a D100 is rolled to determine pocket money. For our example, we chose an ancient sword and concealing robes, the roll leaving us with 61 credits. Character creation is a bit crunchier here, mostly due to the freeform use of XP. There's also a greater emphasis on specialization and less on inherent abilities. Both advancements and equipment can fetch high prices here, but either one has to be earned. That said, I do like how the talent trees almost seem tailor-made to be an attachment to a character sheet, and they've managed to expand force powers without creating spell bloat. It's an interesting mix where classes are able to be specialized and varied at the same time, but I can easily see it being a bit too restrictive for some. Instead of using numeric comparisons, the Genesis system uses a symbol-based approach with different die types. We'll cover the die and symbols first before covering their use. Boost die and setback die have six sides and represent situational modifiers based on the environment, condition, and circumstance. They're analogous to the plus two or minus two modifiers effects in other games. Ability dice and difficulty dice are eight-sided. The former represents your basic aptitude in a given task, while the latter represents how challenging the task will be. Proficiency and challenge dice are 12-sided and act as upgraded versions of ability and difficulty. The former is granted from your skills and the latter from adverse situations or elite enemies. These dice have the best and worst results you can roll. The final die is the force type, which is also 12-sided but acts differently. It's primarily used by force users to generate light or dark side points to spend on force abilities as they may generate as many of these die as their force rating allows. However, it's also used at the beginning of a session to generate the pool of destiny points for the light side, the players, and the dark side, the GM. Players can use light side points to grant advantages or upgrade ability die, but they're immediately converted to dark side points after a resolution that the GM can use in the same way, creating an ebb and flow between the two sides. Each die, force die aside, generates a set of results in the form of symbols. Like the dice sets, they're paired into positive and negative forms, each pair canceling themselves out. Success and failure results are the basic results, and they act as the determining factor whether a roll was successful or not, obviously. Advantage and threat die act as the but-and dice results, for lack of a better term. 
They don't add to the die results to determine success or failure, but they can create effects that both help or hinder efforts after the fact. These can range to activating criticals or weapon abilities, to allowing extra maneuvers, to environmental effects. Finally, Triumph and Despair are the two strongest results, and are only found in the Proficiency and Challenge dice. These can act as both their aforementioned positive or negative results, but they can also activate powerful effects that the others cannot. The closest analogs they have to other games is critical successes and failures. When generating a die pool, you refer to the ability and skill the action requires, rolling the former as ability dice and any ranks in the latter as proficiency dice. The GM may add boost or setback die if the situation calls for it, but will also add 1 to 5 difficulty and or challenge dice as appropriate. When the result is rolled, if you have more net successes than failures, the roll is a success to a degree of the successes remaining and vice versa. This is not too far removed from the degrees of success mechanic that was used in Warhammer 40,000 roleplay. The final wrinkle in this is in regards to combat. If enough advantage or triumph results allow an attack to activate a critical, the target must roll a d100 and consult the critical table, adding plus 10 for the roll for every critical they're still suffering the effects of. Rolling and generating results here is certainly easy, and the ideas for situational effects are far better presented than in its predecessor. But I do think there's a problem with intuition. The symbols can look relatively similar at first, and I think a greater distinction between individual tiers was called for in these cases. It's an awkward hurdle at first, but I'd imagine it's one easily overcome with an index card or two. More advantageous is the fact that one's pool of abilities is tastefully limited. It keeps the focus on the die rolls rather than micromanaging what gets used when. If I were to describe the Genesis system in one term, it would be hybrid. Much of the game's mechanics feel like a response to its predecessors, both from Fantasy Flight and the Star Wars RPG chronology. Warhammer 3rd Edition had too much feature creep. This game does not. The 40k RPGs were nigh impossible to cross over without additional legwork. This game is far easier to do that and almost encourages it. And in the context of the Star Wars RPGs, it's a hybrid between the crunchy and the narrative. That said, I'm willing to entertain the argument that it's too spread out, having essentially three different RPGs with their own expansions and modules. Additionally, I'm unsure about the move to strictly focus on the Episode 4 part of the timeline. This may make for greater focus, but I think there's a lot more opportunities that they're missing out on. I'm not going to hold that against them, though, as it might have just been a consequence of the massive retcon that was done in preparation for The Force Awakens. If only they knew. The ultimate elephant in the room, however, is going to be the use of custom dice. Now admittedly, Fantasy Flight Games has learned their lesson from last time, and included a conversion chart if you wish to use your own dice. But even with that, a symbol-based approach is going to be a hard sell to some simply because it's breaking habits. A lot of habits that have been ingrained in gamers for years. The fact that FFG is mostly known as a board game company doesn't help matters either. If you can get past that hurdle though, you have a very strong entry in RPGs that manages to get a narrative feel for the source material without being tied down for balance concerns. It's a very, very polished game, and one I can easily recommend to anyone, but I'd advise getting a die roller application or a handful of the game's original dice before doing so.